This past December, I spent my winter holiday break on the Norwegian Pearl, embarking on an epic 12-day cruise from Miami, Florida, down to the Southern Caribbean and through the Panama Canal. We stopped at eight different ports, getting to experience a little taste of Aruba, Curacao, Bonaire, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Panama along the way. If you've ever wondered what a cruise down to the Southern Caribbean would be like, then you've come to the right place. Join me as we take a look at the ship, the amazing ports, and of course, what it's like to ride through one of the world's great engineering marvels, the Panama Canal. We'll sail back to Miami and celebrate New Year's Eve at sea, and then we'll have one extra unplanned excursion at the very end to cap off a fabulous winter holiday break. This was a long trip and there's a lot to cover, so the video is divided up into chapters in case you want to skip to a specific section of interest. I'll leave all relevant links in the video description below, plus I will give you my verdicts on each port as we go and reveal my winner at the end. Alright, with those housekeeping notes out of the way, let's get started. We sailed out of the port of Miami. This was my first time not only departing from this port, but coming down to Miami in general. Norwegian has its own dedicated space, and after a few hours of cranky post-red-eye flight waiting, it was finally time to board. As tired as I was from the overnight flight from the west coast, I never miss a sailaway party. You'll always find me up top with a glass of champagne ready to get the vacation started. This was a particularly fun sailaway too, since this was really the only opportunity I had to actually see a bit of Miami. Not all port departures are scenic, but this was a fun one. And just like that, we were off. Our first two days were at sea, so we had plenty of time to get to know the ship. The Pearl is one of Norwegian's older vessels. She was built in 2006, but was refurbished in 2021, so the interior does feel modern and up-to-date. She's 965 feet long, with a guest capacity of almost 2,400. So while she's not anywhere near the size of some of the gargantuan cruise ships out there today, she's certainly not small either. Although the inside is fresh and modern, the bones of the ship are from 15 plus years ago, so she's pretty basic in terms of amenities. No zip lines or laser tag or even water slides here. Just your basic cruise ship amenities and features. There are specialty restaurants, some theaters and entertainment venues, plenty of bars, a casino, a spa, a gym, a library, a pool deck, all the essentials are there. The food was pretty great across the board and the drinks, particularly at the inside bars, were very tasty. The spa was also wonderful. We ended up getting a pass for the full cruise and making it a daily pre-dinner ritual. Criticisms of the ship would be that the quality of the entertainment was a fair bit weaker than what I've experienced on newer Norwegian ships, and for some reason there seemed to be a fair bit of empty, unused deck space. They had plenty of opportunities to include more fun amenities on board, but it was often just empty. Also, and this is just a personal preference, the beds were super hard. We really chose this voyage for the itinerary though, not the ship itself. We had two sea days at the start and two at the end of the trip, and the Pearl had just enough to do to keep us occupied for four days. The bulk of the trip consisted of port days, so most days we didn't spend all that much time on the ship anyway. After two days at sea, we arrived on Christmas Eve at our first Southern Caribbean port, Aruba. Part of the Dutch Caribbean, this one happy island is known for its dazzling white sand beaches. We booked an excursion through a third-party company, since none of the Norwegian options looked all that interesting. The bus met us right at the cruise port, and we headed off to Palm Beach, where we transferred to the catamaran that would take us out to the wreck of the ES Antilla for some snorkeling. The Antilla was a 400-foot-long German passenger and cargo ship and is the third largest natural wreck in the Caribbean. The Antilla became stranded in the Caribbean when Germany invaded Poland in 1939, starting World War II. The Antilla was aiming for harbor in a neutral port, but when Germany eventually invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940, the Dutch authorities in Aruba tried to seize the ship. The German crew weren't going to just hand her over though, and they opened the valves, set some fires, and basically sank the ship. Today, the Antilla sits in two pieces, only about 30 feet down in the warm Caribbean waters. A rare opportunity to see such a large wreck up close without having to strap on dive gear. After the snorkeling, the rope swing on the catamaran was open for a bit, and then we headed back to shore. We spent the rest of the day wandering down along the coast, stopping for lunch at a lovely beachside restaurant, heading back down toward the port of Oranjestad, where the ship was docked. 
Aruba's a pretty big island, so we didn't end up walking all the way back, but we at least got to see some more of the coast before it was time to grab a cab and get back on the ship. The verdict on Aruba? I thought it was really beautiful, but it's also very built up and very touristy. Do I want to go back one day and explore some more? Absolutely. Christmas morning, we docked at our next port, also part of the Dutch Caribbean, Curaçao. While many people may not be able to find Curaçao easily on a map, I'll bet most are familiar with its famous namesake, Blue Liqueur. We booked our excursion through the cruise line this time, and actually all of the remaining ports we did end up going with one of Norwegian's offerings. Today's was a two-parter. First, we headed off to visit the Curaçao ostrich farm, where we did a tour of the grounds, learned all about these gigantic birds, and even got to feed them at the end. I don't think I've ever done that before, but brace yourself if you ever go, it does hurt a little bit. Those beaks are big and powerful and the ostriches do not hold back. Also got to stand on an egg to showcase just how strong those shells are. Next, we were off to visit the Hato Caves, which are the largest on the island. I love caves, so I was really keen on visiting these. The cave here is over 300,000 years old and it's pretty easily accessible. You head up some stairs, and once you're inside, it's a pretty basic walk on a paved path, and there are handrails and just enough illumination to see where you're going without losing that cool creepy factor. The weather was turning as we arrived at the caves, which ended up being great because we actually got a chance to see the rain coming down inside the cave. Such an unexpected treat. Upon arriving back at the capital of Willemstad, where the ship was docked, we spent the rest of the day wandering around the town. The historical district of Willemstad is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Area, famous for its colorful Dutch colonial architecture. We were fighting the elements at this point, but of all the port towns in the Dutch Caribbean, Willemstad was the one I wasn't going to miss. Besides, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. So off we went, heading over the Queen Emma pontoon bridge, which is kind of unique because it actually swings around to allow freighters and other ships access to the main port. It was Christmas day, so most of the shops and restaurants were understandably closed, but the historical district was still lovely to experience. We capped off the day in Curacao by buying a small bottle of, drum roll please, blue Curacao. The verdict on Curacao? Really interesting island, and one that I know I likely wouldn't have gotten to if it wasn't part of a larger itinerary. Not sure if I'll be back here again, but I was really glad that we got an opportunity to visit. Headed back on board for some evening Christmas festivities while we sailed away toward our next port. I wasn't sure what to expect from our next port, Bonaire, which is also part of the Dutch Caribbean. I certainly didn't know where it was or what it offered for visitors before we booked our cruise. Even the staff at the shore excursions task on board the ship didn't seem to know all that much. We ended up choosing an excursion called Bonaire Outback and Beach Stop. First impressions upon docking at the capital of Kralendijk were, wow, that water was a beautiful shade of blue. So far, so good. Our transportation was a bright yellow four-wheel drive, high clearance vehicle, perfectly built for off-road adventuring into the island's rugged interior. One look at that thing and I was super pumped for whatever lie ahead. Our guide was wonderful, a crafty local who had so much knowledge to share. We learned a ton, particularly about the native Yatu cacti and their many uses for it. We stopped often for him to give us information and even the occasional demonstration. I don't know what I was expecting, but riding off into a desert on a Caribbean island was definitely not it. I was so surprised at the topography and climate of the interior. I guess despite the excursion having the word outback in it, I didn't really take that seriously. After riding around the remote part of the island's interior, we were taken to a place called Sarban Beach, which turns out is a popular windsurfing spot. Oh, and it's also one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever seen in my life. No biggie. We didn't have a lot of time there and would have stayed behind on our own to extend the visit, but unfortunately the ship stop in Bonaire was a bit short and we didn't want to risk not getting a cab and getting left behind. Bonaire did have one more surprise up her sleeve for us though. Once we got back to the dock, we realized there was an awesome swimming platform right in front of the ship. 
So we got to have some Caribbean sea swim time in the bluest water you can imagine with the pearl as the backdrop. We were back on board and sailing away by 1 p.m., but it was quite the jam-packed few hours. The verdict? It was still early on, but I knew Bonaire was already a sleeper candidate for best port. While I'm excited one day to experience a beautiful resort in Aruba, Bonaire offers the exact opposite experience. A peaceful, under-the-radar, rugged gem with not a mega high-rise hotel in sight. Santa Marta was a big day. My very first steps onto the South American continent. Hello, Colombia. I've now got six of the seven continents under my belt, but of course the final one is going to be the hardest. Okay, getting back to Colombia now. Norwegian's excursion offerings for Santa Marta weren't super exciting, and there weren't any great external offerings either. I really wanted to visit the nearby Tirona National Park, but we just didn't have the time for it within the ship's arrival and departure parameters. So we ended up booking a somewhat vaguely described tour to the Tiranaka Indian Reserve. I didn't capture the detail from the Norwegian website at the time, and it doesn't look like cruises still stop in Santa Marta, so this may now be a discontinued experience. This is a tough one for me to discuss, because I think the site itself could have actually been really good if presented correctly, but unfortunately the logistics of our visit were such a mess and so poorly put together that it kind of ruined things a bit. It wasn't until after I got back home and did some research that I really understand more about where I was and what I saw. We had about a 90 minute bus ride into the countryside and then a little hike into the jungle to get to the archeological site. If the description of the activity had been slightly better, I would have dressed more appropriately for jungle hiking. Instead, I was in sandals and a skirt. Not ideal for walking through the Colombian jungle. That aside, the archeological site was the ancestral home of the Tirona indigenous people you get to walk through the ruins of their thousand-year-old settlements. The highlights are these terraced stone circles around which their homes were once arranged. We then continued the walk down through the grounds to a community center of the Kogi people, who are the direct descendants of the Tirona. Ordinarily, there are handicrafts for sale and cultural shows and a few other things, but from what I heard, the Kogi people weren't told that a giant tour group was coming that day, so things weren't prepared as normal. We did get some tasty snacks prepared for us though, and that was greatly appreciated. There's also a small museum on site where you can see indigenous artifacts such as hunting tools, baskets, and musical instruments. It was helpful to walk through the museum to get a better sense of the people who lived here, since our guide didn't actually explain all that much. At the end, we had some time to spend by the Don Diego River, which was a lovely way to cool off in the tropical heat. We then hiked back through the jungle to the buses for the long drive back to Santa Marta. The verdict? I don't have much of an opinion on Santa Marta itself because I only saw a bit of the city through the window of the bus to and from our way to the archaeological park. The Indian Reserve and Archaeological Park itself had great potential to be a wonderful educational day, and the grounds were beautiful to walk through, but the organization was such a mess that the day was mostly just hot and confusing. A bit disappointed with Norwegian on this one. The next day was our second Colombian port, Cartagena. I'd heard wonderful things about Cartagena, and I was really excited to walk around a Colombian city, since we didn't get the chance the day before in Santa Marta. We booked an excursion called Aromas and Flavors, which included a boat ride through Cartagena Bay, some food, some drink tastings, and a guided tour of Cartagena's walled old town, our second UNESCO World Heritage Site in the past four days. The excursion actually included two boat rides, as the cruise ship docks on an island across the bay. So we started off the day with a short little ride where we got some great introductory views of the harbor in town. After getting off the boat, it was a short walk to the entry point of the old town. You walk through a tunnel, and then the old town slowly reveals itself. Cartagena was founded in June of 1533, and this colonial walled city was designated by UNESCO in 1984. It took about five seconds for me to understand why. This historical area is absolutely breathtaking. There's a reason Cartagena is so popular for tourists. It's truly like stepping back in time. Our guide was wonderful. He was such a wealth of information and kindness, and really brought the rich, complex history of this town to life. The walled city is very easily explorable on foot, and at the end of the tour, we were given about 45 minutes of free time to explore on our own. Ugh, I wish we'd had more time here. 
We debated on how best to use the free time we had, and in the end, we just wandered around some more, checking out as many streets as possible. The group stopped to watch some dancers at the end of the free time period before we all headed back to the boat. The return boat ride was longer, more of a cruise around the harbor this time, complete with an open bar and some food tastings. I cannot emphasize how good the food was. They started us out with some fruit before bringing out the big guns. That's so good. We probably had six different types of street food along with rum-based cocktails. That rum was delicious and went straight to my head. It is probably my greatest regret of the trip that I didn't find out exactly what kind it was. We cruised around the harbor for a bit while I merrily stuffed my face before heading back to the Pearl. We had a little time left at the end, but the cruise port is pretty isolated from the rest of the city, so we decided to check out Cartagena's cruise port village and it was actually kind of fun, although I was a smidge tipsy at this point. But they had a nice store and a little zoo area where I followed around some peacocks and gawked at macaws. We maxed out our time and were one of the last to get back on board. The verdict? Yes, yes, yes. Go to Cartagena, spend more time there than we did, and eat everything. Definitely a candidate for best port. The Panama Canal. One of the world's great engineering marvels, this day was a highlight for mostly everyone on board, and for many people was the main reason they booked the cruise. We of course approached the canal from the Caribbean side and we're going to make our way through the Gatton Locks before exiting at Gatton Lake, the central reservoir that holds the water supply that operates the lock system of the canal. Our itinerary was only to do a partial transit, so we never exited out onto the Pacific side. Instead, the ship would turn around inside the massive lake and head back out to the Caribbean. I do have a separate video that is a more in-depth look at the experience of crossing the canal, so be sure and check out the link above if you want to see more. I spent most of the canal crossing shifting all around the ship to get the best view. The top deck of the bow was obviously quite crowded, but I was able to get great views from the sides of the ship and from the stern as well. In some ways, those areas were more fun. I loved watching the little electric locomotives that guide these giant ships through the narrow locks, and the sides of the ship give you a wild perspective on how crazy it is to put enormous freighters into what are basically tiny water elevators. It was some good nerdy fun seeing all the different kinds of freighters go through the canal, but apparently for them it's entertaining to watch a cruise ship do the same. So many people on the decks of the freighters going in the opposite direction were taking pictures of us. To them, we were the novelty. I finished watching the transit through the massive front windows of the spa. Once we were out on the lake, that was the end of my canal crossing experience. Everyone had the option to either ride back down with the ship through the canal again and back out into the Caribbean Sea, or get off on Gatton Lake and do an excursion in the canal area. We chose to get off, so we boarded some lifeboats and were ferried to shore. The verdict? This was so freaking cool. If you're an engineering nerd, a geography nerd, an ocean lover, really, this is an amazing experience for anyone. A must-do at least once in your life if you can make it down to Panama. We were ferried to awaiting buses and then had a lengthy ride to our next destination. We booked an excursion called Eco Cruise on Gatton Lake and Monkey Island, which was a wildlife spotting boat ride on the quieter back channels of the lake. The area is so rich in wildlife, it's home to various monkeys, sloths, anteaters, iguanas, and plenty of exotic birds. The excursion in total was about five hours long, and unfortunately about four of those were spent on a bus driving the highways of Panama, which was not something we expected. The boat ride itself was about an hour and really fun. We saw a lot of birds and plenty of monkeys, including capuchins that I've never seen in the wild before. Now, the boat guides do feed them, they lure them down to the boats with grapes, and I wasn't totally thrilled with that practice as these are wild animals, but they're trying to make the tourists happy and it doesn't hurt the monkeys. I have to admit, seeing the monkeys come down to the boat to grab their snacks was kind of cute. On the way back, the bus dropped us off in the city of Cologne. While we were out doing our excursion, the Pearl had turned back and exited the Gatton Locks and was waiting in Cologne for everyone to gather on the Caribbean side. 
We did have about three free hours in Cologne, but honestly, there's not a ton to do here and the cruise line did advise of some potential safety concerns. We ended up doing a bit of souvenir shopping and snapping a photo or two before heading back on board. The verdict? There are lots of fun activities to do in the canal zone. You'd be better off with one that doesn't have you spending 80% of your time on a dull Panamanian highway. As for Cologne, unless you're into duty-free shopping, skip it. Our last port of the trip was in a Central American country that's on many a bucket list, Costa Rica. We docked in Puerto Limon, whose province is home to jungles, mountains, and beaches, a perfect combination for my first taste of Costa Rica. Puerto Limon is obviously on the Caribbean side, which I was to learn is much lower key than the more popular Pacific side. No big resorts or hotel chains here. It was so hard to choose how to spend the day, but we ended up booking an excursion called Wildlife Immersion Exploration and Kayak Adventure. The first stop was Kawita National Park for a little bit of hiking. Had a wildlife sighting before we even started the trail. Check out those bats at the bathroom. The trail was a raised platform set a couple of feet off the jungle floor, so the walking was super easy and the surroundings were magnificent. Our guide was great, he had such a sharp eye for finding all the critters and creatures. Lots of monkey sightings here, but I think I was most fascinated with the insects. I'm not usually much of an insect girl, but I kept getting left behind because I was constantly stopping to watch these little critters go about their jungle lives. Such an amazing walk, I was so bummed when it was time to turn around and head back. The next part of the day was kayaking near the town of Puerto Viejo. I'm such an uncoordinated kayaker, so I was really lucky that one of the guys went with me in the tandem kayak. He probably ended up doing the vast majority of the steering. Seeing the jungle from the water was incredible. More monkey sightings, some sloths, and even iguanas way up high in the trees. Maybe I'm just not a lizard expert, but I had no idea iguanas climb trees like that. After kayaking, we were given free time for lunch in the town of Puerto Viejo. It's one of those cool beach towns that makes you just want to rent a little hut and stay there for months to soak it all in. We barely had time to find a restaurant, eat, and run back to the bus, but this is a place I know we'll be back to. The verdict? I mean, it's Costa Rica. It's world renowned for a reason. And while I'm curious to see the Pacific side eventually, I think I might be more of a Caribbean side girl. Costa Rica definitely lived up to the hype. We even had a serenade at the dock for departure. As our dock singers put so sweetly into song, it was time to head back to Miami. We had two days at sea ahead of us, including New Year's Eve. This was my second one at sea, and I find them so much fun. The Pearl doesn't have a screen on the pool deck, so we did the countdown inside the main atrium. A few drinks and some strolling amongst the revelry, and before I knew it, 2023 was upon us. We headed up to the pool deck a bit after midnight to dance until the wee hours, which for me is an extreme rarity these days. Got the obligatory picture as well with the Tostin Pool ice sculpture, of course. All in all, a wonderful evening and a fun, happy way to close out the night, the trip, and the year. Cruise ships always dock super early at the end of their route, and since our flight back to the West Coast wasn't until that evening, we decided on one last little bit of fun before heading home. A trip to the Everglades. This was my first time, and the Everglades has been on my list of places to go for so long. We piled into the airboat, and our guide gave us the rundown, and earplugs. These boats are way louder than I was anticipating. The guide was so perfect, he was exactly what you'd imagine a Florida man who gives swap tours to be. He was funny and knowledgeable and kept us very well entertained. He took a break with the commentary in the middle of the ride so we could pick up some speed, and man was that fun. The gators we finally spotted toward the end of the tour. They're regulars, and the guide knew them individually and was able to share some detail about them. Gators in the wild, perfect way to close out an epic trip. This was the longest cruise I've ever done, and now I feel like I can't ever go back to the shorter ones. 
I loved being able to really settle into life on board, to have time to try all the food and the drinks and the activities, and not feel rushed. Eight days of ports, plus a trip to the Everglades, the experience went beyond expectations. So who's my winner for best port? Ugh, this is hard. My top four, because I couldn't just pick three. In alphabetical order, would be Bonaire, Cartagena, Panama Canal, and Puerto Limon. Okay, now who's my winner? Honestly, this is really tough, so I'm gonna do a bit of a cop-out here. If I had to recommend to someone who'd been to none of these places what the highlight of the cruise would be, I'd have to say the canal transit. It's such a specific bucket list experience, and it's something anyone who loves travel, ships, or the ocean should experience once in their lives. Now, if I had to pick what's the one port on this itinerary that I'm going to head back to first for further exploring, Puerto Limon. It's a great base for exploring what the Costa Rican Caribbean side has to offer, and Costa Rica in general is right up my alley. Sloths and monkeys and jungles and mountains, take me back tomorrow. Thanks for coming along with me on my 12-day cruise through the Southern Caribbean and Panama Canal. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like as it helps the video grow. I've got a few other cruise videos too, so check out the playlist above if you'd like to see more. Thank you so much for watching and checking out my channel. Please do subscribe if you'd like to join me for more future travel adventures. Hope to see you soon, and until then, happy travels.